Hello, everyone. Welcome to our online event. I'm going to wait a little bit longer and some people may still be joining. And uh, yeah, I can see many in the waiting room. So let's just wait for 30 seconds so that people don't miss the beginning of our event on churches in the Mediterranean addressing desertification through responsible banking. Yeah, so many of you may have wondered what on earth is the link between desertification and banking? And also, what does this all have to do with children? At the end of this webinar, I think you will understand why we organized this event and take from this event to your churches and to your communities very powerful resources which can help to address desertification in the Mediterranean region and across the world. So my name is Frederike Seidel. I am the program executive for child rights at the World Council of Churches. <laughs> this event and the many resources which were developed for this event is funded by the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which we really thank uh, for this amazing support. And we will start um, first with uh, introducing my colleagues who are Dr. Henrik, Reverend Henrik Grape, my colleague based in Sweden from the WCC Ecology and Economy Program. If you can spotlight my colleague Henrik, he will be facilitating one of the discussions. And Dr. Manoj Kurian, who are our director of the Commission on Health and Healing, uh, who may not yet be able to be spotted, but just to let you know, he will be facilitating one of the two discussions. And I would like to now ask uh, Walter if you could share the one minute video, which will be available for everyone in five languages and which we are kind of officially launching today with this event. Are you concerned about children's future in the light of the climate emergency? Then find out how your banking choices can help. Desertification in the Mediterranean and beyond is forcing people from their homes. Find out how a brighter future is possible through responsible investments. Together, we can stop desertification and secure a better future for our children. Potential ways toward a sustainable and just future exist. Shifting away from fossil fuels and strengthening the resilience of ecosystems is possible. We must be part of the solution and tackle root causes of global warming. Bank responsibly. Protect our planet and our children's future. Thank you very much to Anam Gill, who has been the one creating this video for us. And if you're here with us uh, today, you probably understand very well the urgency of climate change and what this means for children. In fact, for those children and young people who understand the science, for example, what the IPCC report says, it's very difficult to cope with that. And many children even face so-called pre-traumatic stress syndromes, just imagining what would happen if we don't manage to stop the increase of CO2 emissions. This is why we have invited some of the really top specialists on the scientific side to be with us today and give interventions. Before I um, ask, however, for an opening prayer, I would like to also encourage each of you to introduce yourself in the chat box so that we all know who is online today. And also I um, inform you that this event is being recorded for those who couldn't join us today. I would like to see now if Reverend Felix Yao is with us online. Yes, exactly. I am here. Wonderful. So Reverend Fiabu Felix Yao 
is from the Evangelical Presbyterian Church in Ghana and a youth member of the All-African All Conference of Churches General Committee. Thank you so much, Reverend Felix Fiabu, for agreeing to do our opening prayer. Thank you very much. All right, let us pray. Everlasting Lord, we thank you. We give you all the glory for enabling us to gather this moment to think about some global issues concerning all of us. I pray that you accord us retentive memory and I pray that you give us a heart that can accept things that we will discuss here today so that we can spread to other parts of the world. We pray that through this program, many people will be enlightened on these desertification issues and about children. Oh Lord, we pray that you surely do it for us. And at the end, we will give you glory and adoration. Thank you for this gathering in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and now I am so delighted to announce that we have with us today the director of the Ecumenical Institute for Theology, Almova Faka in Morocco. Reverend Jean-Patrick Nkolo-Fanga will talk to, to us about the desertification in the Mediterranean region and the role of people of faith in the response. Over to you, Reverend Nkolo-Fanga. Thank you, Frédéric. Uh, I want to share my screen. Okay. So let me start by a few words to understand what is for us desertification. And after that, we will see, uh, we'll talk about some actions uh, for fighting against desertification. Uh, those actions will be presented in two parts, international actions and religious actions, uh, specifically the Christian and the Muslim actions. Uh, talking about this desertification. How can we understand this? It's important for me to, 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 to share those few, those few words. Um, several definitions which emphasizes the, the degradation of the natural environment, which results in one hand, a disappearance of plant cover, and on the other end, an acceleration of erosion, which increases the rigidity and decline in soil fertility. Erosion, which is the consequence of over-exploitation of the environment, is accompanied by a set of processes leading to a disruption of the balance of the initial ecosystem. All those things are accentuated by human or animal pressure. In the Mediterranean region, we can say that in the arid or semi-arid areas of North Africa and the Middle East, extremely strong human and animal pressure on ecosystems leads to progressive desertification. In the countries of Southern Europe, this pressure has fallen sharply in areas with, with low agricultural potential, uh, mainly in mountains, which are increasingly doomed to abandonment, which creates new problems such as vulnerability in the, to fires, to fires forest. The characteristic of the Mediterranean climate low rainfall, strong winds, large temper temperature variations are conductive to water erosion and wind erosions, the effect of which are amplified by human action. Talking about uh, the fight against desertification, the United, 
United Nations Conference on Desertification in Nairobi on the 1977 result in the adoption of an action plan to fight desertification structured in 28 recommendations. The UN Convention to Fight Desertification. I want to share with you some response of people of faith. First, um, some theologians, Christian theologians, which were in Marseille in France uh, last year, have published a, a document called Manifest pour une théologie à partir de la Méditerranée. These documents uh, share many thoughts uh, which want to, 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 to look how can we make theology when we are in the Mediterranean region. This document is show to us that we must, uh, we must think about uh, peace theology. How can theology can constrict a uh, peace world or the world in peace. And they say that there can't be peace in the Mediterranean region without taking care of the problem of the sea, of the land, ecological problem. So uh, theologians have to look how they can fight again those problems like desertification. Some Islam response. In 1986, Prince Philip organized a meeting in Assis, uh, uh, French cities between Jews, Christians, Muslim, Buddhists, and Hindus to assess how each religion could contribute to environmental protection. Dr. Abdullah Umar Nassif, the Secretary General of the Islamic World League, delivered a lecture titled Muslim Declaration of Nature. This declaration emphasizes a theology of creation. He said, the essence of Islamic teaching is that the entire universe in the creation of God, man can only find peace by obeying God this peace being available at all levels, including that with nature. Man was promoted by God to be his lieutenant, caliph. It is therefore his responsibility to be responsible for the maintaining of the unity of creation and preserving the balance and harmony of the entire creation. Then that it will be judged on the day of judgment on his ability to have maintained this. In uh, the month of July 2009 in Istanbul, some 50 Muslim scholars and political leaders gathered under the leadership of the very famous preacher Yusuf al Qaradawi, in order to establish an action plan to fight against climate change. This is the plan, the Muslim seven year action plan on climate change, organized by some Muslim association and was, uh, is an important contribution, the result of many, many, many uh, organization of uh, Islam fields. The declaration does not distinguish Muslim from non-Muslim. It notes a collective responsibility, a general deterioration. In return, it initially calls on all nations, people and their leaders to promote an alternative system. The Ecological crisis is a quantifiable fact and many shares of responsibility can be appreciated. It follows for the Muslim world 
as for the Christian world's a theological and ethical questioning. The different religious traditions should therefore provide didactic speeches so that their members take ownership of the measures to combat, to fight against desertification, carry out joint advocacy actions with institutions with a view to promoting social justice and fair exploitation of natural resources. It seems like when we want to fight desertification, it's possible to have an interreligious dialogue and actions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Jean-Patrick and Kolo Fanga. And it is amazing to hear about um, these efforts like the Marseille Manifesto and um, the Muslim Declaration and the many opportunities for interreligious efforts. Now I would like to ask uh, for the intervention from my colleague, program executive Dinesh Suna. He's in charge of the Ecumenical Water Network and Land, Water and Food Advocacy. And he is sending a recording from Riyadh, where he has just been attending the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, 16th session of the Conference of the Parties. Hello, uh, good evening to you from uh, Riyadh, from the venue of the UNCCD COP16, the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. And this is the 16th conference. Uh, and this is by far the biggest uh, uh, COP ever uh, on desertification and hosted by Saudi Arabia. And I'm uh, very happy to inform that there is a strong presence of the faith communities uh, here in this COP. Uh, the World Council of Churches itself is here for the very first time uh, to cover and uh, intervene in various processes related to the COP16. The faith community also here have been talking about uh, various good practices that many of uh, us are doing, uh, but that is not enough in, a, as, uh, in another event just uh, hosted by World Council of Churches, evidence-based advocacy uh, on land and ecosystem restoration. We want to highlight uh, that we have to document our good practices and amplify the voices and then talk uh, to the world what we are doing. Because without data and without evidence, we cannot convince the multilateral partners or the governments that the faith communities are equally um, key and a critical player. And now talking about children uh, who can force in a way the banks for responsible financing in order to uh, tackle uh, desertification is an important issue because be it a biodiversity loss, be it climate change or be it land degradation and desertification, the future generation are going to suffer and children are at the forefront. I'm happy to inform you here that we do have uh, some organization who are not only talking about children's issue, but they are talking about children at the table. As someone said, if the children are not at the table, they are on the menu. And that is what we need to be considerate about, that children must take part in those important decisions. And the Child Fund uh, is present here uh, talking about uh, the issues that children face. Uh, so I think uh, I wish you the very best. I wish I could have joined you uh, in person in this uh, webinar in Geneva, but unfortunately I'm arriving late and uh, therefore this rec uh, I'm recording this with the help of Sinesa. I want to thank them for this help and I wish you very well that children talk about responsible financing uh, to address desertification, particularly in the Mediterranean region. So signing off from here at the venue of COP16 of UNCCD in Riyadh. Thank you very much. Thanks so much to my colleague Dinesh. And um, if children are not at the table, they are 
on the menu. I think that quote is really saying a lot to us. We will talk more about that in the second part. Right now, I would like to invite Mercedes Cameron, sorry, Mercedes Caron, from CONICET, the Argentinian National Research Council, as Mercedes is an expert on trees and will and forests and will inform us what is really essential for us to know in the area of desertification. Over to you, Mercedes. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. Uh, I will uh, share my presentation now. Uh, as Frederick mentioned, I'm Mercedes Caron. I work at the Argentinian National Research Council, but uh, I am currently working in the Mediterranean area, uh, focusing on Mediterranean forests. And that is why I would like to speak today about the impacts of climate change on Mediterranean forests. Uh, as you might know, the Mediterranean is considered a biodiversity hotspot. This means that it is the home for an exceptionally high amount of species, many of which are endemic. This means that these species are not found in any other place in the world. And this is the case, for instance, of the Iberian lynx that is extremely beautiful or the Cretan wild goat. But also many plant species uh, are present in the Mediterranean. We have uh, around 20,000 species that are uh, present in the Mediterranean, 50% of which are endemic. Again, this means that they are not present in any other place in the world. And what makes the Mediterranean such a unique environment is a combination of the Mediterranean climate that is characterized to be uh, dry and uh, hot in summer and mild and wet in winter, combined with the topographic characteristics, so the mountains and the coastlines. These two factors make the Mediterranean extremely exceptional and make uh, the home of different environments, including forests, shrublands, wetlands, and grasslands. And each, in each of these environments, we can find uh, different species. However, this uh, unique environment is highly threatened by human activities, including urbanization, agricultural activity, and land abandonment that was already mentioned before, and of course, by climate change, that is a global uh, problem. And this is what it makes the Mediterranean such an important uh, biologically uh, hotspot, but also make it very vulnerable to the impact of human activities. And this is why uh, we need to call for action to conserve the biodiversity hosted in the Mediterranean and conserve it through all the levels of diversity, from ecosystems of the entire forest and the entire shrubland until uh, the genes going through the species level and the population level. And I want to highlight here the role of the genes because the Mediterranean is the home not only to unique species, but also to unique genes expressions. So this is something that we have to remember because it might be the key to uh, face climate change. As you might know, and it was mentioned before, uh, our forests provide us with many, many uh, services and goods, what are normally called ecosystem services. And these are not only for the people living in the Mediterranean, but for humanity as a whole. Some uh, services such as biodiversity support uh, are basically um, apply in situ because this means that they are the habitat for the endemic species. Uh, the Mediterranean forests also play a, a key role in regulating water because the few rains that we have in the Mediterranean sometimes are very abrupt and they can generate flooding or erosion and the forests help to control this. They also sequester carbon, meaning that they contribute to mitigate climate change and produce a lot of goods and services that we uh, on a daily basis um, profit from, like medicinal plants, fungi, uh, mushrooms and uh, timber, of course but also have a strong economic and social value, and in many cases also in a spiritual value, because the people in the Mediterranean uh, tend to live in close relation with nature. However, these uh, important uh, forests are strongly um, threatened by uh, drivers of degradation, and the main drivers of degradation in the Mediterranean are currently climate change and land use change. And in terms of land use change, we have two different processes taking place. In one hand, the deforestation, and in the other hand, the land abandonment. Regarding climate change, the Mediterranean is particularly uh, interesting, but uh, uh, scary at the same time, 
because it's a low emission region. So uh, compared to other regions of the world, the Mediterranean doesn't emit so much uh, greenhouse gases, but it's a high impact region. This means that we don't emit that much uh, greenhouse gases, but we are going to be hit by climate change very, very strongly. Uh, is considered by a uh, climate change hotspot, meaning that around 20% uh, of the, the Mediterranean warms up 20% faster than the rest of the world. And the projections indicate that in the Mediterranean, we're going to face not only warmer conditions, especially over land and over uh, the summer, but we are also going to experience uh, changes in the precipitation patterns. The few rains that we are going to have are going to be less frequent and much more intense. And this, of course, might produce floodings and soil erosion. Uh, we have different scenarios to understand climate change. Uh, if we consider that um, the humanity uh, increased their effort to reduce uh, the greenhouses um, uh, emission, we can expect in the Mediterranean an increase in temperature between 1.1 and 1.5 Celsius degrees. But if we continue doing business as usual, if we don't change anything in the way that we produce or we consume, we can expect the warming between 1.3 and 5.3 Celsius degrees, which is extremely high. You can see in the figure here in the left of the presentation, this is a map of how climate looks like in the Mediterranean today. So we have all this uh, red part is the Mediterranean climate and the orange part is the desert climate. In At the end of the century, we are expecting that much uh, a bigger area will be uh, dominated by desert conditions. So part of the Mediterranean climate will be lost in favor of desertic conditions. And this is extremely bad, not only for forests, but for all of us. Regarding forests, the forests are going to be impacted by climate change. And indeed, they are already impacted by climate change in several ways. And the most frequent uh, way that forests are impacted is just by overpassing species physiological tolerances. This means that the heat or the drought are just too much for the individual and they just die. This is sad, but it's how it works. But it can also produce um, physio phenological mismatches. This means that, for instance, a plant produces a flower, but at the time that the flower is open and it's a pollinator, the pollinator is not ready there. So these mismatches might produce that we uh, lack uh, seeds or fruits. And the last um, impact that uh, I would like to mention is that climate change is forcing species migration. So many plant species and animal species are migrating north, uh, which is possible in, in the continental uh, Europe, so the northern part of the Mediterranean, because the species are located, for instance, in the south of Spain, can move north trying to track uh, more suitable environmental conditions, so colder conditions. However, this effort can not be done in the southern rim of the Mediterranean because if the species want to migrate north, trying to uh, follow colder climatic conditions, they face the Mediterranean Sea, and then it's impossible uh, to migrate naturally. And such a, in, under such cases, we might need to apply uh, assisted migration actions. The second point I wanted to mention today is land use change. Uh, as you know, the Mediterranean is a densely populated area and is the home of ancient civilizations. And the Mediterranean landscape is an intrinsic mosaic system where you can find uh, croplands, uh, grasslands, forest, um, urbanizations. Um, so everything completely interlinked and where people live in close relation with nature. And this makes it very interesting, but also very dangerous. Because, for instance, um, the growth of uh, the population in the southern and eastern rim of the Mediterranean uh, has forced um, the societies to increase the agricultural activity. So they increase the deforestation rate in favor of agricultural activities, which, of course, is understandable, but is, um, is bad for the forest. While in the north, northern part of the Mediterranean, there was a change from agricultural system to more intense agricultural system that requires less land. And there was an abandonment also of traditional livestock uh, grazing systems. And all this, this, uh, this change in activities resulted that in the southern rim of the Mediterranean, there was a decrease in forest uh, cover and an increase in crops. While in the northern part of the Mediterranean, there was an increase in forests and a dec decrease in co uh, crops cover. These, of course, have different uh, impacts on the forest and the ecosystem services that the forests provide. 
For instance, a land abandonment can result in good or bad uh, impacts depending how we look at them. For instance, if the forest is abandoned, if the land is abandoned and the forest reclaim the nature, and then we can see a recovery of the natural vegetation, but at the same time, and as was mentioned before, the, the risk of wildfires increase if the forest is not managed. So this is happening very frequently in the northern part of the Mediterranean, while in the southern part of the Mediterranean, the land is abandoned because the soil lost its productivity and cannot support any more crops. So in this case, the soil is exposed to degradation and desertification. And this is the last point I want to mention today. Uh, so that land and soil degradation and desertification is extremely exacerbated by climate change, but also by land use change, especially by land abandonment. And it's basically, um, it happened when the soil lost the capacity to sustain plants, animals, and humans, but also microorganisms. And the factors that contribute to soil degradation are, of course, the rain, but also the wind. The loss of organic matter that can be lost due to overexploitation by crops, but also can be lost by a bad management of water that can wash down the, the soil organic matter and can be also affected by salinization of the soil of or uh, water. All these processes, as I mentioned, are a result of a growing population and an incentivization of the socioeconomical activities. And this is extremely important in the Mediterranean because around 30% of the land in the Mediterranean is considered to be under high or very high sensitivity to desertification. But of course, we still can do some things. And what I would like to highlight here is what we can do to um, prevent uh, soil degradation, desertification, how to face better climate change, and how to prevent a land abandonment. So basically, what we need to do is to increase the Mediterranean forest adaptive capacity. Adaptive capacity to climate change, because climate change is going to happen, and we need to be adapted and to be able to face it. And how we do this in the Mediterranean, it's not easy, but it's, it's only one very straightforward message is that we need to conserve biodiversity. We need to conserve all the levels of biodiversity from ecosystems to species, populations, until the genetic material. And I want to highlight again the importance of the genetic elements because in the genetic elements is where we have the capacity to adapt to climate change. Because the species that live in the Mediterranean nowadays, they are already adapted to warm and dry conditions that are going to dominate many more areas of the world. So the Mediterranean might host already today the key to adapt other forest types to climate change. And in the Mediterranean, finally, it's also very important to keep people living in the land. And we have to secure that people has a good quality of life to prevent land abandonment and all the risk and degradation that might be linked to this process. This is all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mercedes, for sharing the, the scientific facts. And you also highlighted how the region of the Mediterranean is actually a low emission region. And uh, there is an injustice there of that it's actually 20% faster, uh, the global warming there, than in the rest of the, of the world. And um, you also used the word scary. Uh, if we continue business as usual in terms of the current CO2 emissions. It is particularly scary also for children. Hence, again, the awareness we need to have on the pre-traumatic stress syndrome of children who understand what this means for them. But thanks for highlighting also the avenues of solutions. And in that area of the solutions which we must accelerate, I'm really glad that we can today hear from the Middle East Council of Churches. We have with us Garen Yosol Kanyan, who is the Archdeacon in the Armenian Church and manager of Eco Justice Unit at the Middle East Council of Churches. Garen, you are also an agricultural engineer. Um, I'm really glad that you can share with us today some of your examples of work. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, good to see you in this uh, green virtual meeting. 
thank you for the explanation by uh, Dr. Mercedes for the endemic and extinction and effects on the Mediterranean. Uh, we are so proud to be in this Mediterranean Sea and we are working day after day, even though we have a lot of problems in this uh, Middle Eastern area, a lot of wars and a lot of effects. And we will see how bankings are affecting uh, the desertification, affecting also uh, uh, the greening projects sometimes. So I would uh, to share with you my presentation. I am Garen from the Armenian Church, uh, being for uh, four years member of the Eco Justice and Eco Theological Unit in the Middle East Council of Churches, and uh, the topic of Eco Theology and Eco Justice started since a while in the Middle East, uh, but. It was canonized for, let's say, uh, or take its place in the life of the church since uh, eight years, almost uh, to be an actual topic to discuss and to present it. Uh, also to teach about or teach through the eco-theology, uh, the, the revelation of God and the revelation via nature, because all our liturgies in the Middle East and the education of the church are based on the natural and agricultural practice. Also, I am an agricultural engineer, worked in the Middle Eastern countries for a long time, and uh, happy to hear this linkage between theology and churches, and in the same time, agriculture and environment, they are united in this network. So uh, we will see in the next slide uh, what we are talking about. Uh, that what is the context I, I present very briefly and the church address and the greening project and then the banking loss and their absence in the life of the Middle East. So the first one is the Middle East context. What does it mean Middle East context? The context, as we see in the Mediterranean context, uh, th there is a huge diversity in the natural components, either in the altitudes, the latitudes, the fauna and flora. And in the same time, there is a huge diversity in the heritages uh, of the people and uh, cultural effects that we had in the Mediterranean and in the Middle East specifically uh, related to belief in the matter of the faiths and uh, denominations. There is a largest denominations uh, diversity and Middle East Council of Churches is in charge to make this ecumenical and unification work to, uh, between the churches and the eco-theology and the eco-justice was one of the tools that unites all the youth and church leaders in the same time and also the parishes together to care for their nation, for their forest and for their water. So these heritages are introducing that sometimes there is a, a huge transfer of people from an area to another because also migration and leaving the countries, due wars and due problems or denominational issues uh, they they obliged sometimes, as you are seeing now, the flee of the Syrian people to other countries, the uh, migration or the leaving of Lebanese people during the war, also in Palestine, in Jordan, in Egypt, youth are migrating. So this transfer also has its, its own impact uh, in this context to change the settlement of our minds sometimes also to be uh, to be attached more in our traditions in the same time. Uh, also the populated areas and very rural region which are present in the east of the middle, middle uh, of the Mediterranean Sea also these are uh, a good component for 
uh, stopping the desertification sometimes. Also, it is an open uh, challenge to us to increase the, uh, the loss of green areas and the areas which are uh, turning more after the, uh, day after day to a desert or non habitated people areas. Just is a quick question, Garen, because at my end, I don't see your slides uh, moving. Um, perhaps uh, Walter, my colleague, can no, help with the... No, 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 no okay. now we are changing to, okay, other, to the other uh, slides. And okay. how the church on to all these started to address via the eco-justice. Uh, eco so the Middle East Council of Churches and prior to the Middle East, uh, there was a small uh, gathering of many people who are involved in the environmental activism. One of them I was. Uh, so we started to introduce the Green Patriarch Ardias and the Laudato Si of the Pope Francis and also to join some natural benedictions which are present in the Oriental Orthodox denominations and and the green liturgies which are introduced in the protestant tradition so these uh, these components started to be involved in the life of the society and the church start to think what does it mean desertification related to their teaching and what does it mean making more green areas and making nature our friend in the understanding of St. Francis of the environmental uh, issues and St. Tecla, uh, who, who, who are one of the major saints of Middle East, and she has, she has the ecological stuff in his life, in her life. So we chose that St. Francis and St. Tecla will be the two patron saints in the context of ecology via the Middle East Council of Churches. Moreover, the development of the season of creation, which is now a global plan, we are all aware about it, from the 1st of September until the 4th October, this is what we are uh, in charge, that the church and the church leaders started to talk, to pray, and to make in their sermons the topic of ecology and also in the same time the desertification so our third our third uh, address uh, after these two components was in the next slide when the MECC and other churches started to go and make the awareness about desertification and greening projects to the schools and universities uh, and making more development in the public theology, in the seminaries. And the last uh, success story was to introduce the eco-theology via MECC, Atime, and monasteries to the life of the education of the seminarians, first. Second, to make in the universities and the school, because the universities and the school in Middle East are mainly oriented by the churches and monastic orders. So like the University of Jesuit, Antonine, uh, monastic order of Maronite uh, clergy and so on. So these universities started to promote the idea of desertification in the scientific way. Also in the same time, the greening project via churches and via MECC, how to interfere to each other. And last year, we had a very big conference, around 500 people came to hear what does it mean eco-justice and how to develop the green areas and reduce the emissions and also development of the waste management. So this was the first attempt in the Middle East and the church was addressed to stop stop the defeat of the ecological problems. Now we are going to see in the next slide, please, uh, the greening project. As uh, you are uh, all in charge of ecological 
plans uh, and I saw in the list who are present now and they are hearing us. Uh, my only advice is to make every day a new greening area. Uh, always we teach our youth that in your life, at least, at least, you should plant from one until 50 trees in your life. So this is to the people who are not in charge of agriculture, who are not charge of environment. But we, as professionals, and we are gathering now here on a global way, I advise always to have on a daily basis in our mindset I should plant one tree at least in my uh, in my trimester. In three months, I should at least plant only one as a person. And if we are responsible to greening areas, as we do in uh, some other project in agriculture, so we are thinking to reach the largest green area to stop the desertification first and also to manage the balance of ecosystems between the weather and later in the climate change stuff. So here we are seeing the youth, how they are so happy by planting the olive tree. And we will see how, what, why olive tree. Uh, it is a sign in the Middle East, also the cedar. It is a sign of Lebanon. Uh, the olive tree is the sign of peace. And we have a lot of war here. So in the same time, the olive uh, oil is at the base of our food. Uh, so this make we, the, uh, the plantation of olive trees and sustainable impact uh, in the life of the churches because the olive oil also is used in the polychrism, olive miron, surp miron, mayron in Arabic. Uh, so and this olive oil was the main component of this holy sign, uh, which is used in the confirmation uh, uh, sacrament. And it is the sign of the unification of Christians, uh, mainly in the Oriental and Orthodox and uh, Catholic uh, families. But in the same time, it is the sign of power of the Middle Eastern people because we see that olive oil is the best gift given to each other once we are in a big visitations. So we will see now how the church start to teach their youth and their uh, monastic orders, their seminarians, their uh, church leaders, even though we see that uh, Bishop Shahe uh, the bishop of the Armenian church also was present to plant and the first olive tree of the uh, chrism, chrism grove of uh, in Anjar in Lebanon. So in the next slide, we will see how the greening project. Uh, and here it was the first, the first event happening, how to the youth should come and be with the nature in the same time. We see in Lebanon, the Kfardabi and the Apple Day and the hike. In the next slide, uh, we have we have also the first greening project, which was olive trees and lemon trees in Kfarfalus, also again in the southern area where was the war in the past years, but the, the trees are good now after the war. Also, uh, we see other greening projects where we are invented. We invented the uh, chrism grove or the chrism orchard. Uh, and in four uh, villages in Lebanon, we have now the largest chrism orchard in Anjar. And uh, nowadays also, as we heard from Saudi, yeah, also there is a very large olive uh, orchard land in the uh, in the Sahara in Saudi Arabia so this this is the relation and the continuity of our project also we have in Lebanon and uh, Syria also we have in the next uh, slide uh, uh, we see that there is another project in the Echo Day in the spring where you see 
the the priests and the and the youth who are who are from a very big diversity they are planting and the, in the next uh, we will see again another project in egypt which was the joy orchard it was a, an orchard of uh, palm trees and the joy we see in the children children are very involved in this planting also in the next slide uh, we see how in Egypt there is more greening area. We see the desert is changing uh, step by step. And in Jordan and in Syria, there was a very good uh, project of greening. Also in the next slide, uh, please. Uh, this is in Syria, where was after war a hope a hop project in the close to the river Orontes and in uh, Wasilla in Jordan. In the next slide, we see how people are planting a lot of flowers and trees in the same time. So the last of my point, and I will finish here uh, by the last issue that the loss, the loss of banks and their fundings in our region made the church to take care about the desertification work. And we are in charge to, and we hope to see in the next slide, uh, how the church, uh, the banks will care, will care for the greening area because we have a lot of these problems in Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, and Jordan, and so on, and thank you. And if you have some questions, you can write me as I thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. And um, indeed, uh, if we can also, have you, if you agree that we share your presentation with others, it would be excellent. Yes, sure. Who, who wants, you can share with okay. them the presentation. And uh, we now um, going to hear an intervention by an expert on farmer-managed natural resources restoration. His name is Tony Rinaudo from World Vision, and he is in a different time zone, midnight over there, so sending his recording. H Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be with you, and thank you, Frederick, for the invitation. My name is Tony Rinaudo. I'm the Principal Climate Action Advisor for World Vision Australia. I've been with World Vision 25 years, and prior to that, I lived in Niger Republic, West Africa. When we arrived in Niger in the 1980s, the landscape that confronted us was at the point of ecological collapse and barely able to support life, even though this had been a biodiverse uh, dryland forest in my lifetime, with uh, uh, fertile farmlands in the clearings, with even wildlife and permanent springs there are consequences for environmental destruction. And so people were suffering. Increased frequency and severity of drought often led to hunger, water tables dropped, temperatures became higher. We experienced severe uh, sandstorms. In my mind, if deforestation was one of the root causes of all these problems, then the solution should be relatively easy. Let's plant trees. And I tried very hard, I studied, I consulted, I experimented. Nothing worked in a sustainable or economically viable way. 80% or more of the trees died. And the thanks that I got from the very people whom I tried to help was, they called me the crazy white farmer because they didn't understand the value of trees in, in this context. I would have given up and gone home, but I felt, no, God doesn't make mistakes. And this was a typical day, delivering seedlings to the villagers, knowing full well most would die. I, I shut up a prayer, perhaps of desperation, asking God to forgive us for destroying the gift of his creation and asking him to show us what to do. That day, even though I'd been on this track two and a half years, eyes open, I, I realized how blind I was that the solution was literally at our feet. And when I took a closer look at this bush, I quickly realized it's not a bush, it's a tree which had been cut down and it's trying to re-sprout. And across many landscapes in the Mediterranean, 
in so-called in some so-called desert areas, many landscapes contain what I call this underground forest of living roots and dormant seeds with the capacity to regrow and they can grow uh, very quickly and we can do this type of restoration at low cost. And so the whole emphasis of my work shifted from, uh, it became much, much less a technical, um, a technical approach to problem solving and much more about uh, changing what people believed about the value of God's creation and the value of trees in these landscapes. And in the Christian context, I would say, in order for us to restore landscapes, repentance has to come first. We haven't done a very good job at uh, taking care, being good stewards of God's creation. And humankind, the, the, the earth is suffering as a consequence of that. The method is very simple. Simply select, find and select the trees that you want to regrow. Manage them through pruning and thinning. Protect them from threats such as fire, wandering livestock, cutting. Monitor the growth as the trees come back. And then, in particularly in the case of developing countries, it's very important that people are allowed to benefit from the work of their hands. This is the major incentive for why people do this. Over a 20-year period, tree density in Niger increased from nearly zero to 40 trees per hectare across 5 million hectares. In 20 years, there were 200 million trees regenerated by communities themselves, creating agroforest parklands, which uh, created a better microclimate for growing more and different types of crops and livestock. The soil was more fertile, temperatures and wind speeds were lower, much better environment for growing uh, food and, and, and uh, other crops. And so people's incomes increased. They're now able to send their children to school and many, many other benefits resulted. The biggest change that I see in these landscapes is actually the restoration of hope as people now have a greater agency to create that future that they want for themselves and their children through caring for God's creation. Benefit, benefiting from it, yes, but managing it sustainably. I love this quote. In the ninth century, the caliph of Harun al-Rashid of Syria could travel all the way back to Baghdad under the shade of trees. When you look at the um, satellite image, you, you hardly believe there was ever a forest there. Now, I'm not saying that every desert once had a forest or has this underground forest that I'm talking about with FMNR, but many areas that we assume to be desert are actually modified landscapes. They were forested. Human behavior has changed that landscape. In many cases, the underground forest still exists in the form of living stumps, uh, sometimes roots with the ability to sprout and dormant seeds. These pictures are from Jordan. And what looks like a purely desert landscape, it's actually a hyper-arid area, is covered in these bushes. And occasionally you come across one that's managed to escape the nibbling of the goats and the camels and has revealed its true character. So I, this gives me hope for much of the Mediterranean area. What we consider as desert, some of those landscapes could in fact be harboring these underground forests and have the potential to be restored. I only had time to whet your appetite. Please go to this website if you want more information. There's a manual there. Very soon there'll be a free online training course and other resources. World Vision is endeavoring to restore 1 billion hectares of degraded land worldwide. And we'll only achieve this very ambitious target with and through partners. So if you want to know more, the FMNR scaling team would love to hear from you. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your, your workshop. So you see there's a lot of hope coming from the FMNR methodology as well as church examples like the one shared by Garen. Over to Manoj now for the questions and answer and discussion session on this first part.
Thank you very much. Uh, we had such a wonderful uh, session. Thank you to all the resource persons. We would like to go into Q&A sessions. We have very expert uh, resource persons here and all of you. Please type in your questions. Uh, in the meantime, uh, 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 Mercedes, uh, Karen, uh, uh, there was a question that came from Frederick. Uh, apart from climate change, what do you think about the effects of overgrazing and, and farming subsidies? as a cause for desertification in the mountains of uh, Med in the Mediterranean e region. Can you, can you please uh, respond to that? Yeah, uh, I don't know about the subsidies. This is not my expertise, but I can tell about the ecological uh, consequences of overgrazing and farming. So um, especially the southern part of the Mediterranean is particularly fragile um, to grazing and overgrazing. Um, and farming is expanding in the southern rim of the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, the farming system is often um, too demanding for the land to be able to sustain. And this end up uh, eroding the soil, uh, making the soil to lose uh, its properties, its organic uh, matter, and its ability to provide food. And at the end of this uh, exploitation system, the land is abandoned and the desertification process uh, um, becomes more and more intense. Uh, I believe that what is needed in any case is uh, to come with advice and to, to train the people and to give opportunities uh, to produce in a more sustainable way um, because the land that is uh, degraded and the soil that is lost is extremely difficult, difficult to be repaired, if not impossible in our lifetime. Therefore, uh, any um, excessive farming that is taking place in the ground today should stop and we should try to move to more sustainable ways of producing food. But for this, we need to support the people in a way that they can afford living a decent life and a good life with the resources that the land can produce. So we need to pay, learn to pay, pay fair prices for the food that there is producing our lands and to pay fairly to the, to the farmers. The same in overgrazing. Uh, overgrazing activities are quite common, in, especially in the southern rim of the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, because the 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 people that um, do these activities, they they are kind of forced to do it because to be able to to live a decent life, they need to have many many animals, and the piece of land that they have to pasture is too small. So we need to to approach this problem as a, uh, in a more global way and looking at the interaction between people's quality and of life and sustainable development to be able to provide them with tools, including fin financial tools, to be able to sustain and to manage the land in a more sustainable way. Any other questions uh, regarding, I mean, we have clearly linked the agricultural practices and 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 pastoral practices. Um, any 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 questions? Any any reflections? Judith, yes, please. Thank you, Manash. I have a question to the research persons. Uh, can you see any political way to combat desertification in the region? Perhaps, uh, Rabuent um, Jean Colo Fanga, you mentioned already some efforts in Marseille by. The church is coming together and uh, efforts by Muslim leaders. Do you see a political response coming? Uh, yes. There's a political response needed and engaged by um, theologians, uh, Christian theologians and Muslim theologians. I've noticed that uh, the evaluation of all the actions uh, against desertifications, I've point the results that um, it's it's needed to coordinate many actions with many actors because it looks like if there's also uh, some institutions or non-governmental organizations which fight against desertifications. The, the population, the peoples, are not involved uh, on the, the actions. So it's, it's important to engage peoples 
And that's the reason why uh, religious leaders have to teach, to mobilize, to involve, first, the people of their religions, second, the institutions. And it looks like political leaders must be involved by uh, advocacy of religious leaders. Thank you. Thank you so much. There are two people who have ra raised their hands to ask questions. Fode uh, Bangura and then Chetan Sharma. Fode, please. Thank you very much, um, everyone. I think my question is in the chat, but uh, I just want to re-echo it so everyone can hear in case they're not looking at the chat. So my question is for Mercedes. It's, uh, the question is, are there any significant gaps in current research that needs to be addressed so that we can better understand and combat desertification in the Mediterranean region? Thank you very much for your question. I think it's, it's very interesting. And of course, there are many, many gaps in current research. But if, if you ask my personal opinion, I think one of the most um, overlooked an uh, needed aspect is to better understand the genetic resources we have in the Mediterranean, especially the forest genetic resources, um, because in the genetic component of the Mediterranean forest might be the, um, the resources that we are going to need to fight desertification. Meaning that uh, when understanding the genetic component of forest and tree species, we are able to detect which species and which organisms have their genetic material that makes them more uh, able to face future climatic conditions. So we need to understand, to identify these populations, these individuals, and we need to protect them because as uh, it was proposed in another presentation, we need to reforest uh, many areas. And for that, we need to choose the good genetic material to be able to think around to think about how climate will be in the next 50, 60 or 70 years from now. So we plan the material that is going to be able to face future climatic conditions. I think this is very important and we need to work into that direction. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have Chetan uh, asking, and then we'll give the floor, maybe the final word to Mi Michaela for maybe a, as a response, in fact. Yes, uh, Chetan first. Yes. Uh... <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Korean and um, uh, colleagues, thank you for giving this opportunity. It's not really a question or reflection uh, of what uh, Mercedes said just now, Mercedes Caron, that uh, we and all the stakeholders need to see this whole desertification and the climate issue from the lens of the science, from the science and the biodiversity conservation to which uh, as she said, that the genetic uh, uh, species and what what would work best and what would not work best. And finally, that if we took up some pilots, be it in Mediterranean or in other parts of the world, to prove this concept, that would indeed be helpful to drive the message that yes, this desertification can be controlled by its implementing scientific and technically sustainable practices. This was just a reflection. Thank you, Chetan. Uh, I pass the, uh, the, the floor to Michaela, please. Dr. Manoj, it is uh, such a pleasure to be here with you and uh, all the guests in uh, this workshop. I want you only to point out uh, the results coming from IBES uh, as an intergovernmental platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services that serves also for uh, the conservation of biodiversity as well as for uh, the Convention on Desertification. Are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, thank you. So in this regard, uh, I uh, put for you the final report for the desertification, which is an assessment uh, that is tracking uh, thousands of uh, scientific articles all over the world related to desertification. So I believe that it is uh, really a very good resource in terms of science uh, that can apply all over the world. And uh, also you may find there uh, some very uh, well uh, written down political messages for uh, the policy makers. And uh, as a reflection, I want only to stress that desertification is uh, a real stress. It is, it is a real threat 
and uh, probably it will be more and more dramatic for our lives. And I'm looking for the history and uh, it is uh, really important to go back to the history and to see the Acadians uh, disappeared after about 30 years of um, drought, uh, severe drought that was somewhere in 2000 years before Jesus Christ. And we need also to remember that the uh, Valley of Nile was so uh, rich in biodiversity during the Pharaoh's times. By now it's not so rich. So the history is coming with real, real proofs that uh, things are uh, all the time uh, evolving, either in a positive way, either in a negative one. Also, I want to stress that uh, from uh, Germany, it was uh, a professor written, uh, involved in a project uh, to find out uh, if possible during the history, some of the crops disappeared from our, uh, uh, let's say, from our cultivation or cultures. So they uh, succeed together with um, a colleague from the Middle East to find out that um, about 10 species disappeared from our civilization. We cannot any longer have this kind of crops for our uh, civilization. I was really uh, interested and uh, appreciate Mercedes, Guerin, Tony, uh, Rinaldo, uh, presentations and I was very very happy to go in Kenya and understand what a feminar means and uh, this is another story very interesting sometimes we need to go back to the history and sometimes we need to make a restoration uh, going back to maybe 200 or 300 years or maybe longer this can be one of uh, our goals for uh, desertification and the, another one point should be polluter pay, which is coming from the Rio Convention uh, principles. And this polluter pay is not well implemented. I'm not sure why, but should be maybe tackled by the church in this regard. Because you see, uh, in Africa, there is no possibility to respond accurately to all the um, um, commitments taken under the climate change or desertification or biodiversity mm. conservation because of the lack of capacity building. And this is the reason also for the Eastern European countries. So Thank basically, you. Thank I you. consider that we need, we need to reconsider everything related to polluter pay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. so Thank much, you. Uh, Thank you Michele. Much. And thank you, Manoj, for the session. In fact, um, while we are speaking here, there is every minute massive money going into fossil fuel expansion, which aggravates global warming. And in the UK, for every 10 pounds you put into your pension fund, two pounds is linked to deforestation. So I'm saying this to move us into the next session in which we will look more carefully at a really big source of hope. A source of hope because we are talking here about a very important blind spot. It happens to be one of the both most powerful levers to address root causes of desertification and global warming, but one of the least utilized. So the idea of this uh, event, thanks to the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, is also to show this blind spot and explore how our member churches and partners could become drivers of accelerating climate solutions through this blind spot. So I'm going to now ask Walter to put on the screen a um, very brand new tool which we have created for this purpose called Faith in Our Land, Faith in Our Children's Future. And before I hand over to Rosie Wenner, an expert on this matter, I need to tell you that since the Paris Agreement was signed, 
6.9 trillion US dollars were invested into fossil fuel expansion. Expansion meaning that we are not doing what science tells us, which is using the oil which is already out of the ground and which is, according to the International Energy Agency, sufficient for the transition. But no, there are the so-called carbon bombs, which means projects underway or planned, which our banks, our pension funds, are massively financing without asking us. So that source of hope is that we can talk to our banks. We as bank clients can put pressure on them and they must actually listen to the clients. So if you are among those who have, let's say some hundred dollars on a bank account and saving, do you know what your sleeping money is being used for? Well, Rosie Venner will show us through the example from the UK, how significant churches can be in accelerating climate solutions by shedding light on that blind spot. Over to you, Rosie. Thank you so much, Frederic. Uh, I'm just going to share my slides. So it's a great honor to be with you and thank you to Frederic for this invitation and for setting the scene so well and thank you to the other contributors for your expert contributions. Um, I'm glad to bring some reflections to you on the actions that we've been taking on responsible banking as an ecumenical Christian organization, the Just Money Movement, uh, based in the UK, and to share a story of some advocacy currently being undertaken by churches here in Britain and Ireland. Conscious that we're part of a much wider movement of people of all faiths and none who are working across civil society to work for a greener banking sector that protects people and nature and tackles some of the issues that we've been speaking about today. I just want to very, very briefly introduce Just Money Movement. We began as the Ecumenical Council for Corporate Responsibility over 30 years ago bringing together representatives of the churches in the UK who were concerned about the behaviour of companies, um, specifically the actions of mining companies in the Philippines. And much of our earlier work was on defining what corporate responsibility means in terms of ethics, human rights, environmental concerns, in the context of a church with investments in those companies and a faith that speaks of justice and care for the marginalised. So over the years, our work has developed to include grassroots education and mobilisation to bring about a wider movement of Christians concerned about how money is used, whether that's our own money as individuals or our money as institutions, and to speak up against injustice in the way that banks and businesses behave. So ethical banking has long been a part of our work and um, we've developed practical guides for churches looking to connect their faith and their finances. We've been working alongside student groups in the UK, uh, conscious that young people are often leading the way and acting prophetically with their own finances and calling for changes from institutions. And we've been developing some campaigns to mobilise churches in the UK um, focused on some specific banks on their climate and environmental policies. Frederick has already said a little about the motivation for working in this area. Um, I think this is a very helpful quote from the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, which sums up why we need to be concerned about the way banks are acting. Finance plays a pivotal role in shaping the economy, our society and the environment. Banks are not simply intermediaries of money, they are critical agents of change. And as Frederick highlighted, where we have 6.9 trillion US dollars still being funneled into the fossil fuel industry, uh, where banks are still the key financiers of other sectors that are driving the climate crisis, particularly uh, forest risk, risk sectors leading to deforestation. You know, we really need to have our eye on what the banks are doing, particularly where we are customers and investors. So that's our motivations for being involved. What do we think responsible banking looks like? What are we advocating for? So firstly, we need to see banks excluding all finance for fossil fuel expansion immediately. That's the first priority. Some banks are making progress in this area by not providing finance to new projects, but they still have loopholes that enable them to finance and invest in the companies that are leading on those projects. So more transparency is needed. We have many banks that have set 
their net zero commitments for 2050. But to get there, we need to have some interim targets that are ambitious that take us closer to that to that uh, 1.5 degree aligned transition that needs to happen. So as banks are using their leverage with their with their clients, they can they can draw attention to their transition plans. They can they can use their power as a bank to to ensure that those sectors are making the the right transition plans to get us to that future that we need. And then thirdly, we rapidly need to see an increase in green finance. Uh, we need more investment in climate solutions. That investment uh, needs to significantly be scaled up by the banks. And we're, we're beginning to see that, but the ratio of investment uh, is not anywhere near it should be. So there's still far, far too much going into harmful sectors, into fossil fuel finance and not enough into the types of projects that will tackle the climate crisis and get us to that greener economy. Uh, so what are the levers of change that we can use and what's the, the role that banks can play? I've tried to sketch out what I think that movement looks like. Wherever we're based, it's likely to be the case that the mainstream banks massively dominate the market, uh, with ethical greener banks currently holding a much smaller segment of the market in terms of assets and customers. And so to see the scale of change we need to shift finance away from harmful projects and sectors, into climate solutions and into nature positive projects, then we need to see a broad movement. We need to see many different uh, actions and campaigns. We need the mainstream sector to change, which is how I have put on the left of the, the slide, transforming the system. And we need to build up the support for alternatives, which are called champion alternatives on the right of the slide. And these actions need to go hand in hand. So I think where possible, where we know that our banks are not taking sufficient ac action, we can seek to switch to green and more ethical banks. We can use our savings and investments to support climate solutions. And we may be able to do that as institutions, or we can mobilise our congregations and members to do this with their own funds. And there are banks that are values led that are seeking to support positive economic, social and environmental change. So we should be championing them. But we do need to transform the system as a whole. And there are there's a significant role that, that churches can play here as customers, as investors, and I think as a moral voice in society, beginning to shift public opinion on what banks are for and how banks should behave. We can also work with our elected representatives to push for regulatory change to ensure that banks take account of their climate risks and act accordingly. Uh, and we don't have time to go into detail around this before, but there are also increasing opportunities to engage in legal action uh, as part of wider movements across society to hold banks to account, for example, for their greenwashing practices or their continued investment in sectors that are harmful for the future of our children. So finally, I want to just share very briefly a story from the UK of uh, uh, what we've been doing in terms of mobilising churches. So earlier this year, our national ecumenical structure, Churches Together in Britain and Ireland, came together to host a webinar looking at the links between banks and the climate crisis. From this grew a, a broad coalition of organisations, both within and beyond the churches, to draw up an ecumenical statement of concern targeting the UK's biggest five banks. These banks have about three quarters of the share of the market in the UK. Many of our churches bank with them and they are major financiers of fossil fuels. The statement of concern was signed by over 70 churches and Christian organisations nationally and locally and was delivered to the banks last month. We've since received responses from four of the banks and we're now planning our follow-up engagement, which will include coordinating church investors to ask questions at the bank's AGMs next year and supporting churches and organisations that wish to switch bank. Uh, the statement of concern uh, remains open to sign on our website um, and receive some national press coverage. And I've just shared a couple of quotes here from the signatories explaining their motivation for joining the campaign. And I will just close by saying that it has been really encouraging for us to see churches and denominations engaging with these issues for the first time. I think for many of us, it's been a really steep learning curve, making this chain, the, like joining the dots between what our banks are doing and the change that we want to see in the world. But it's now become a real core part of our climate action and our solidarity with communities that are most affected. 
Um, we're very happy to share our learning uh, with others who want to take action on responsible banking. Um, and I'll share my details in the chat if people want to be in touch after this webinar. Thank you so much, Rosie. And everyone is encouraged to look at the details and follow the inspiration coming from those very dynamic efforts in the UK. Also to get back to what Michaela uh, Antoif Antofie said earlier on the need for polluters pay principle, I want to highlight that at the World Council of Churches, we are also now going beyond advocacy and have just started a legal action project focusing on the responsibility of financial actors who continue massively uh, investing into fossil fuel expansion. And highlight the example, which was on one of your slides, Rosie, of the sisters of uh, New in New Jersey, who have actually, as shareholders, um, now started a lawsuit focusing on some of the, the banks in, in the US. Um, and over to you now, Henrik, for a short discussion on what has been shared. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. This will, will be a very short discussion. Uh, um, I don't see any any questions in in the chat so far, but I, I I I just want to underline the importance to connect the certification with the with the with the climate change and also with the banking of fossil fuel industries. That we we often don't see them together, but they are really going together. Even if we do all that we can for desertification, if you don't cut the source that is the fossil fuel industry that fuels the climate change is is useless to do all those things so uh, thank you rosie for for showing the example of the importance to put pressure on banks and financial institutions to change because uh, they are still very short sighted uh, looking for the best profit in in the shortest time but in this case we have to look for the future uh, and especially to the intergenerational justice for the generations to come. Um, I see. Uh, I see. Look, you have in, in in the in the chat. You have shared with us the the importance of seasonal creation, and also looking how we as churches can highlight this in our liturgical year. And I think that is also very important for us as faith communities, not only to be active. Mm -hmm to be a good knowledge, a good science proof for what we are doing, but also have it rooted in our liturgical year, in our prayers, and in our way of, of having services. Uh, that is also important. And I think what we also heard about the importance to, to do this together with other faith uh, traditions, like we heard from the Muslim communities, that we can go in this in this together. I think that is that is very important for for us as faith communities. So I think that's time's up for me, Frederick. So I over to you. Thank you, uh, Henrik. And um, from this consultation, we can also consider forming a working group. So any of you who felt inspired by the what was shared and would like to continue the conversation, please send me a note and we can try to form a, a group. In fact, um, I'm now going to ask Dr. Judith Königsdörfer to end this webinar with a closing prayer. Judith is uh, the person who has kindly coordinated the support from the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the World Council of Churches and who has also a scientific background in agriculture. Over to you, Judith. Thank you, Friederike. So let me please share a few thoughts in the end. Oftentimes, the strife against climate change and desertification is not easy. There's a lot of goodwill, but there are also setbacks and discouragement. Nevertheless, the movement is strong and unwavering. And to encourage you to carry on and continue on your path, I would like to give you a Franciscan blessing. So let us pray. May God bless you with discomfort in the face of overly simplistic answers, half-truth and superficial relationships so that life dwells in the depths of your heart. May God bless you with wrath in the face of injustice, oppression and exploitation of people so that you may pursue justice and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection 
hunger and war, so that you may stretch out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with the folly of believing that you can change the world by doing things that others think are impossible to do. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Judith, for this powerful closing prayer. And as I said in the chat box, uh, there was an email to which anyone who wishes to consider forming a working group or to continue the conversation or to look at the next steps in WCC's initiative through responsible banking, let us know. So this may have just be the beginning of a journey. And thank you so much again for the experts who have shared their wisdom today and for the inspiring solutions examples, both from the Middle East Council of Churches, from Gowan, from Rosie, and from all those who have been with us today. Thank you so much and have a good rest of the day.